right well welcome everybody it's uh, good to have this evening we're excited about uh, how god's going to use this time um as we um as we explore these uh, important issues of of um you know into one year into into this pandemic you know what have we learned what are we learning uh, and we're excited that we've got um, Patricia um, here this evening to to speak to us. Um, so yeah, so this is a um, a joint meeting of the Boston, New Jersey, and Gordon Collins student um, chapters. Um, um, the New Jersey chapter is a is a, is a newer chapter, and the Boston Boston chapter is more established. So we're excited that we can use uh, Zoom to. Uh, bring together uh, people from di different locations um, and we can all kind of learn together. Um, so um, I just kind of wanted to say a little bit about uh, the ASA for those of you who might be uh, new to the organization, um, founded back in uh, 1941. Um, and it is a, an organization that we are scientists and we are Christians. Um, so, uh, in, as scientists, we want to be engaged in the uh, understanding of our universe, uh, exploring the laws of nature. Um, and as Christians, we want to see God's work through that um, and understand um, how God operates through our understanding of um, science. Um, and we believe that God is both the creator uh, of our vast universe and the source of our ability to pursue uh, knowledge. Um, just a little bit about the core engagements of the, the ASA. Um, we have three primary platforms. Uh, the first one is discovery ideas and uh, scholarship. And I'll talk a little bit about scholarship in a minute. Um, we are interested in professional development. Um, and how that plays into our career and calling um, as um, scientists of faith. Um, and of course, we're very um, dedicated to the idea of fellowship and networking and bringing um, people together um, to explore the world of science and faith uh, together. Um, there are 4,000 members uh, worldwide and they are uh, in a variety of different uh, disciplines. Um, there is a quarterly um, academic um, journal that is produced, uh, which is available both uh, electronically or by print. Um, this is um, called Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith, and it has many, many uh, top quality articles. And if you haven't seen that, I would very much encourage you to uh, take a look at that. Um, uh, there is also uh, a magazine, God and Nature. Um, the co-editors of these are Saigard and Aniko Albert. Uh, that is also uh, brought out um, quarterly. Um, the ASA is broken down into a series of local chapters. Uh, as I said at the beginning, this is a joint venture between the Boston chapter, New Jersey chapter, and the Gordon College student chapter. Um, of the 36 uh, chapters, uh, there are 25 in the US, 11 in Canada, and uh, most excitingly to me is um, the growth of student chapters. And we're very, very privileged to have the Gordon chapter with us um, this evening. Um, we meet, you know, um, quarterly, bi monthly, twice a year, or annually, depending on the different um, chapters. And as I said at the beginning now that we have Zoom, it's uh, quite exciting because we can kind of meet um, less geographically bound, as it were. Um, just a little bit about membership. Um, we have a full membership offered at $85 a year, associate also $85. Uh, students are free, so any students out there, please encourage your, your student friends to get involved. It's free, okay? Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about the the ASA. Obviously, we can answer more questions, but we just kind of wanted to give you an overview. Um, now, um, now to you know go to tonight's 
uh, main event. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Patricia Fitzgerald Bukarsley. Um, she was um, so wonderful following the Francis Collins meeting that we wanted her to to, to say more and to go more deeply into to, to things that uh, had been addressed there. Um, so a little bit about um, Dr. Fitzgerald Bukarsley. She received her undergraduate degree from UCLA. A PhD from Boston University and her postdoctoral training at the Sloan Kettering Institute for Cancer Research. Um, she's vice chair for basic science in the department um, at Rutgers um, New Jersey Medical um, Institute, is it? Sorry, I, 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 uh, I may have got that wrong. Uh, medical school, sorry, the New Jersey Medical, medical School. Um, and uh, she's scientific director of the Flow Cytometry and Immunology uh, Core Laboratory at the New Jersey Medical Center. Um, her research focuses on the human innate immune response to viral infections with a focus on uh, plasmacytoid dendritic cells. Um, her lab was among the very first to describe these cells and the first to describe the uh, dysregulation in the context of HIV uh, infection. Her current research uh, focuses on the signaling pathways that lead to the production of type 1 and type 3 uh, interferons uh, in human PDC, uh, how these cells different, differ in different anatomical locations, and how they change in the context of aging with and without HIV infection, as well as immunometabolism of these cells in these different immune uh, compartments and disease states. Okay, Patricia, um, over to you. Um, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me see if I can share this. There we go. Um, so these days I, I'm spending half of my time as provost of Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences, so it gives me perhaps a broader reach, um, but I also want to um, highlight how important the ASA is to me and also my church, Stonehill Church, where I'm a deacon. And along with Andy, we are the co-founders of Stonehill Science. So this is a very dense slide, but I just wanted to talk about some of the, the um, multiple events that have happened over the last year. <clears throat> and we're one year after the shutdown and counting, but a little bit more than that after the epidemic. So the first case is of a mysterious pneumonia were reported on December 31st in 2020. And of course those were in Wuhan, um, one of the largest Chinese cities. Um, by January 10th, scientists from Wuhan and um, Fudan University and University of Sydney had already reported the sequence of the new virus and recognized that it was a coronavirus. Um, the first death that China reported was January 11th. Um, by the 21st, the cases appeared in the U.S. Um, a man from Washington State who had just returned from Wuhan on January 15th. Um, by January 23rd, China had imposed a strict lockdown in Wuhan um, and really got out of their crisis fairly quickly, even though it was massive there. Um, the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency of international concern, which was only the sixth time in history that this had happened. On March 11th, it was declared a, pan, um, a pandemic by the CDC. The, on February 5th, passengers got quarantined on a cruise ship off of the coast of Japan, and more than 700 people were infected on that boat. Um, on February 11th, the virus was renamed COVID-19, um, standing for Coronavirus Infectious Disease or Disease um, 2019. Um, the first case in the US that was local transmission was on February 26th, so someone who had not traveled. Um, followed pretty quickly by the first death in the US, although later it was found out that the virus had been circulating for longer than we thought, and that the first death was in February, on February 6th. 
Um, the CDC initially wasn't letting anyone get tested unless you were in a hospital. Um, so, but then after March 3rd, they allowed testing because tests had very rapidly been uh, developed. Um, on March 13th, President Trump declared a national emergency. And on March 15th, the CDC recommended against large gatherings. Um, and on the 17th, that COVID was now in all um, 50 states. So around this time is when most of us went into lockdown. I am, Andy and I had been out in California at the very end of February, beginning of March to attend our son's PhD grad, graduation um, and dissertation defense. And um, he came home, I flew to Maryland and we were, um, and that was the last trip I made. Um, I came back and, and realized pretty quickly that this was not, not a good situation. Um, and March 18th, um, China reported no new domestic infections. Um, there were still some from travelers returning, but they really had gotten it under control quickly. On March 20th, the New York City was declared a US outbreak uh, epicenter. New Jersey um, very quickly followed suit as being one of the major sites. Um, uh, and it, working in North Jersey, we were inundated with, with patients. And by March 26, the US led the world with the most coronavirus cases, already 82,000 and 1,000 deaths. So it was very, very dramatic. For me, this was a, not, a bookend pandemic, as it were, to my career. I started my career at Sloan Kettering um, and that very first uh, fall and winter, we saw in our laboratory some of the, the first uh, patients with what we now know of as HIV. So I did, dedicated a lot of my life and career to studying HIV infection um, and the immunology of it. And now at the other end of my career, I have pivoted my lab. And so a lot of the work we're doing in my lab is on um, using coronavirus <clears throat> infected um, people samples, human samples to carry out basic immunology research to understand how this virus works. So um, two pandemics in my life. Right now I'm having difficulties. Okay, there we go. So um, this is a, a very recent um, map from uh, that the New York Times puts out and updates regularly on the coronavirus um, count. This is in the United States. So we're now at approximately 30 million cases reported there's undoubtedly probably another 50 to 100% more than that um, that didn't get reported. We're over 543,000 deaths um, and hospitalizations are, are still running high, although the 14 day change is decreasing. So what we can see here is that, I don't know why this isn't working. I zoom all the time. <laughs> So what we see here is the first peak, um, which occurred very early in the US around April. Um, and then things subsided. We had a, a reasonably good beginning of summer, although the, the cases didn't really fall down much below the peak. Um, and then we had another major peak in July, August of that year. And then um, we had the really major peak, look how much higher the cases are um, going into, into the Christmas holidays. Um, you see a small dip after Thanksgiving and then a big surge after people got together. And then the cases have been going down very steadily, um, except for some areas. And I wanna show you what's happening in, in the states that, that we love so much, New Jersey and Massachusetts. So the question is, is this going to continue to go down or is it going to go up again? So um, the Massachusetts map is on the left. And what we see here is that there is what appears to be perhaps um, an uptick again. And if you look at the number of cases, the 14-day change is up 21%. However, deaths are still, are still decreasing and the number of hospitalizations are still decreasing. So that's 
that's good, but the cases are still high. And that's going to be driven mostly by variants, as we'll talk about later. So in New Jersey, this is even more serious. Um, what you can see is a very, uh, although on my screen it's covered by people, but hopefully you can see that there is an, a definite uptick in the number of cases. Um, and there is a big concern in New Jersey that we're um, with the 26% increase that we're, that we're heading into a fourth peak and hospitalizations in New Jersey are going up even though deaths because we can handle the virus and the sequelae to it so much better um, are still going down, which is good. So what have we learned after our initial lockdown, um, which for most of us um, in the Northeast has lasted pretty much the year? Um, we've learned how to monitor and protect our healthcare workers. Um, we've gotten them plenty of PPE and really knowing how to, how to keep people safe in that regard. Um, we know how to do better care for hospitalized patients with monoclonal antibodies that we'll talk about, remdesivir, which is an antiviral drug, uh, dexamethasone. We give clot preventers because um, that's a major, a major cause of problems in COVID patients, we give pressors to help con uh, control the blood pressure. We give immune suppressive drugs to help dampen the so-called cytokine storm. There's a lot of drugs in clinical trials. Um, so a much lower percentage of people are dying from COVID-19. Um, so the numbers are still high because there are just so many infections. We reached highs of daily deaths in the 3000s um, just a couple of months ago. Um, currently, we're still at around um, 1,000 people. Um, we all learned how to use Zoom, more or less, <laughs> and other online services. And I think that that's something that we, we can be really um, grateful for. I was grateful to be able to attend church that way, um, to interact with my colleagues, to attend ASA events, um, to um, attend... Um, the roundtable events with David Tom. I mean, all that's been really important to keeping us sane and keeping us connected. And so I'm very grateful for that. We've learned how to open some schools, um, universities to some extent, um, research institutions um, safely with regular testing. So at the medical school, we are tested weekly, um, but we are allowed to be in and we are allowed to be at a capacity about 50%. Now my lab is small right now, so we can all be there at once. Um, and biomedical scientists all over the world dropped much of what they were already doing and turned their attention to understanding SARS-CoV-2. And research has, has um, gone so fast. So whereas HIV got a slow start, um, SARS-CoV-2 just hit the ground running. So, um, I want to talk tonight about um, immune protection from vaccines, but I'm going to start with what I always start with for my medical students, which is um, the use of passive immunity, um, which provides temporary protection. So passive immunity is when we transfer products of the immune response rather than inducing an active immune response. So it gives you immediate protection. And the classic example of this is maternal antibody that crosses the placenta in, in the third trimester of pregnancy, conferring protection to the neonate. So that really helps the baby very much. And then that continues with um, that there is um, our antibodies in breast milk that also are protective for the, for the babies. So, um, but we also use um, man-made um, antibodies to viruses. So these are so-called monoclonal antibodies that are each identical to themselves to treat. So we can treat um, diseases like in newborns, respiratory syncytial virus. Um, we can treat Ebola virus using monoclonal antibodies. And then you even see ads on TV for monoclonal antibodies that are used to modulate immune responses, particularly in autoimmunity. For example, you'll see ads for Humira. Um, and rheumatoid arthritis and things like that. So what, what can work in COVID-19? So the first thing that was tried was convalescent plasma, which means taking the, the straw-colored uh, 
material out and spinning out the cells and giving the cells back to the person, but you give the plasma from these individuals, which is loaded with antibodies. Um, and these are individuals who have recovered from COVID-19. And it, and it does work in some cases, but not always. So we don't have real good predictors yet, um, other than if you can analyze the quality, neutralizing quality of the antibodies in the, in the serum and the quantity. Um, but it does have emergency use authorization in the United States and, and is sometimes used. Um, but even better is monoclonal antibody therapy um, and both Lilly and Regeneron have products that, that have um, received the emergency use uh, authorization. And these um, antibodies are used early in COVID-19 um, infection and have even been, are even being tried in individuals and households that are exposed to COVID-19 but don't yet have it. Um, and it appears that President Trump, when he was in the hospital, was very, very sick. And, and most likely benefited from the Regeneron antibody. And former Governor Christie from New Jersey received, was in intensive care and he received the Lilly antibody and was out, out and about again, even despite having a lot of risk factors. So they seem to be very effective. And again, um, for treating early in the case of, in, of, of the disease or course of the disease, not late not late when somebody's already on a respirator, you're not going to be able to rescue them that way. I have to, I, this is one of my favorite things. I have to mention uh, that another possibility is the production of nanobodies um, from llamas. So this is winter. He's a Belgian llama um, and in cam, fam, camelids, um, which are camels, alpacas and llamas make tiny antibodies that are one quarter of the size of an immunoglobulin molecule, which are, which are really quite quite large. So they have just, um, just one chain in there rather than four, and they're very tiny. Um, and there was a collaboration um, between um, University of Texas, NIH, and Ghent University in Belgium. Um, and they found that the Aunt Winter, who had been immunized with SARS, SARS, the original SARS, um, which is related to about 79% homology with um, SARS-CoV-2, um, found that these antibodies were able to, or nanobodies were able to neutralize SARS-CoV-2 um, pseudoviruses. Um, and that is being developed as a possible therapeutic in this and other coronavirus infections. Um, the advantages of these nanobodies are they're single chain, um, therefore they're really easy and fairly cheap to produce since you don't have to assemble a four chain molecule and they can be nebulized. So they could go directly um, into the lungs through a nebulizer. So they have a lot of advantages and I think winter is really cute. So, um, but what we're really thinking about when we talk about um, immunity to COVID is is the use of COVID-19 vaccines. And this is the induction of active immunity. So we'll talk a little bit about the process, purpose of vaccines, how do vaccines get approved, what vaccines are in purposes, um, uh, in progress for vaccines in phase three in the US, although actually two of them have already, three of them have already received emergency use authorization, but the phase three trials are continuing and um, we'll just mention that there are many, many other approaches in the pipeline. So um, this is a slide I've used in, in my medical school and graduate school courses for a very long time, but it shows you what the goal of immunization is, and that is to create memory. So the immune system not only can deal with things the first time they see them, but the second time they see them, they can respond um, with immunological memory. So upon first infection, you have an initial immune response. It takes a little while to get it going. Um, and then you get a nice immune response. And when it's no longer needed, when the infectious organism is cleared or virus in, in, in this case, then the levels are gonna go down. But you don't go all the way down to baseline. You have a, a maintenance of cells called memory cells. And let's say it's flu season, you might, a month after you first had flu, run into someone with flu again, and you might not even realize that you were infected. You get a little blip of the uh, 
of the viral replication, but you don't actually get infected. So, and you're, because you've got this memory protection. But the beautiful thing about the immune system is that years later, and this is showing you um, something after two years, that you can get exposed to the same organism again, and your immunological memory kicks in and you get a really strong, really fast response. You don't have this long-term development here and you get protection. And we now know from studies of people who were immunized um, as children in the 50s with smallpox, we know that they have T cell memory that, that still exists today. So it can literally, in some instances, last a lifetime. So we, one of the greatest accomplishments of the 20th century was, was vaccination. Um, and the, the biggest triumph was the eradic eradication of smallpox. So this is a child um, with smallpox, something that hopefully in your lifetime, you're never going to have to see anything like that. But, but this is a very painful and disfiguring and often lethal disease. So when the vaccine was introduced right around here, um, the, um, the number of countries that had cases dropped dramatically. And it was a huge international effort going into all parts of the world, into the bush in Africa. Um, and in 1976, smallpox um, cases dropped to zero. And after several years, the World Health Organization declared that smallpox was eradicated in 1979. So now um, you don't have, if, if you are younger, if you've been born since then, um, or since this stage, you're not going to need a smallpox vaccine and you haven't received them. Whereas um, I was vaccinated as a child against smallpox. So we have a lot of other successes and this is a log scale. Um, these were vi uh, vaccines that were all developed during the, um, the 20th century and particularly the, the latter half. Um, and what we see is, is that the number of rubella, um, that's the so-called German measles, paralytic polio, um, pertussis, and even though there's still pertussis, if you look at it, it's two logs, so that's 99%. Um, mumps, measles, um, and diphtheria, all huge successes of the, of the 20th century in terms of vaccines. And, and now children get um, a lot of vaccines um, and they're protected from all kinds of viruses, from rotavirus for diarrhea to, to all of the classical ones as well. So, um, Developing a vaccine used to take a, an incredible amount of time. So the time from discovery of the causative uh, agent um, is versus um, how long it took to get a, a vaccine. Um, in the case of typhoid, it was 105. I can't see it because it's covered with people. Um, polio took 47 years. It was a major triumph for Tessis. Um, HPV, papillomavirus, human papillomavirus took 22 years. And I have a, had a, a colleague who was um, involved in that, or actually the husband of a colleague who, who ran the, the vaccine program that produced this. Um, hepatitis B took 16 years, measles took 10 years. But look at um, COVID-19, 11 months from the time we um, discovered the virus. So it is it's just really amazing to me that this happened so fast. And this was because that there were international efforts for COVID-19 vaccine. And again, um, every company and almost every medical school, people dropped what they were doing to work on this problem. A typical vaccine takes about 10 years to develop, but the urge with the need for COVID-19 vaccine was urgent. Um, and so there was an unprecedented effort. So as of yesterday, the U.S. had 30 million confirmed infections, about 550,000 deaths. And it, worldwide, um, that's not right, that's 150 million confirmed cases and 2.7 million deaths. Um, and 10,000 deaths reported just uh, yesterday worldwide. So it's still, still a big problem. 
So this unprecedented international effort for vaccine development with leading um, occurred um, and leading candidates filed for approval just 10 to 11 months post identification of SARS-CoV-2. So how do we approve vaccines? Um, vaccines go through um, a process that's usually lengthy and, ex and expensive. First, um, scientists work in vitro and for research and development. Then they move into animal models for preclinical studies. So popular models are, are mice and monkeys um, when you're right before you're going into a human. Um, then they go into phase one trials in humans, which are very small trials. And those are done with young and healthy individuals. Typically, you want to make sure the person um, can, can withstand that, but it is a safety trial. Then they go into safety eff efficacy trials, phase two, and they're going to expand their range of uh, ages and, and um, pre-existing conditions. Um, just to make sure that you still have safety. And now we're looking a little bit at efficacy. In some of these trials, phase one and two for COVID or two and three were combined to make it um, faster. Then you go into efficacy, which is a placebo-controlled large study. So in the case of the, the current vaccines, it was between 30,000 and 40,000 people. Then you go in for a biological license application um, and market review. But in, the, in between this, you can also apply for an emergency use authorization where it's not quite ready to be fully licensed, but, but it is safe enough to go into people. And then there's also what's um, sometimes called phase four, which is post-marketing monitoring. And so that as you get into large numbers of people, um, you can monitor for effects. And if if something is found to be dangerous, it can still be removed from the market even at that point. So um, these just really uh, go through in a little bit more detail. Um, but what I wanted to point out is that in phase two, they're expanding trials and often they will include um, children and elderly to see if the vaccine is safe and acts differently in them. These trials test the vaccine's ability to stimulate the immune response in the most vulnerable of our population, as well as others um, throughout the span of ages, but the elderly um, and children. Um, and efficacy trials are phase three, and that's absolutely required. And here the vaccine is given to thousands of people. Um, in June, the FDA, uh, June of 2020, the FDA advised vaccine makers that they would want to see evidence that vaccines could protect at least 50% of the people who received it. Um, and that was, that was the benchmark they were looking for. Um, in addition, the phase three trials are going to be large enough to reveal evidence of relatively rare side effects that could have been missed by the smaller phase one and phase two studies. So, so, so we were looking as a, as a population for at least 50%. Um, protection. Um, so the next um, stage was uh, early or limited approval. So China and Russia approved vaccines without waiting for the results of phase three trials. Um, we don't do that in the United States. They wanted to get um, priority in terms of having the first vaccines. Um, and experts, though, in the Western world say that there's a this sort of rush process has uh, serious risks. And then finally, approval regulators in each country review the trial results. And these are independent um, boards that are monitoring this. And also um, there's independent safety monitoring boards and they decide whether or not to approve a vaccine. A company can't say, I'm ready to put it out. So during a pandemic, a vaccine can get emergency use authorization um, before getting final approval. So in the US, we have no final approval on any of our vaccines. However, the United Kingdom approved the Pfizer vaccine on 12 to 20. So um, it's in, under emergency use in the US, but is finally approved in there. So, um, so the first vaccines I wanna talk about are um, the messenger RNA vaccines, which are the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. And here, um, it's just a viral P 
piece of viral RNA that encodes the spike protein um, and it's encapsulated in a lipid coat to help it get into cells, gets into the cells and then the messenger RNA um, ends up in the cytoplasm and you get translation on the host ribosomes. And so now you've got spike protein that can be processed. Um, it can be secreted and taken up by other cells or it can be delivered to special molecules on, on so-called antigen presenting cells called major histocompatibility antigens. So um, the messenger RNA vaccine clinical trials were literally the first in humans. Both the companies um, had been, BioNTech and Moderna had been developing messenger RNA vaccines, but, um, but nothing had gone into humans yet. Um, so uh, Moderna actually designed their vaccine in two days after the spike um, sequence was published. So it shows you how fast and flexible that could be. Um, both of the vaccines are two doses. Um, both, in both cases, they were looking at symptomatic infection one to two weeks or more after the second injection. So they weren't looking for asymptomatic infection. They were looking for whether people got sick. And they found that 95% um, essentially effective for both vaccines. So they blew the 50% way, way out of the water. Um, there were some cases in the severe cases in the placebo, but none in the vaccine group for Moderna. Pfizer actually didn't get severe cases in either group. Um, and they applied for emergency use authorization and Pfizer beat out by one week uh, Moderna. But as you know, these were very quickly moved after the emergency use authorization into people's arms. So the most recent um, vaccines that people have been talking about are the adenoviral vectors. And here they put a, the gene encoding spike shown here in green into an adeno genome. They use an adenovirus that can't replicate by itself. So it can't actually cause disease. And they inject that and the virus, um, this virus particle will get uncoded and the, this um, DNA can get translated into RNA, and then it goes through the same process to antigen presenting cells and to stimulate host immunity. So AstraZeneca, we thought they were going to beat, beat everybody to the market because they were already working on coronaviruses um, before SARS-CoV-2. There was a lot of, of thought in the international community that it would be the next epidemic. It requires two uh, two shots, um, and did use the same adenoviral vector as the newly released Ebola virus vaccine. So the, a safety profile for their vector had been established. And um, as you probably have been reading, there's been a lot of concerns about reporting of data. The U.S. wanted additional testing, but it was used in a lot of countries um, already other than then there was a concern about blood clots, so they stopped it. Um, and some of the countries still haven't resumed yet. This was all in the last couple of weeks. But as of yesterday, AstraZeneca looked at its data again, and it's reporting 76% efficacy in preventing infection and 100% efficacy in preventing severe infection. And this is in the US population. So they are filing for emergency use um, authorization. Johnson & Johnson um, just got theirs on the um, February 27th of 21. They, their shot differs in that it's a single shot um, and it was found to be 72% effective in pre preventing um, symptomatic infection and 100% effective against severe disease. So we've really got four really good vaccines perhaps. So this is a, a slide I used in the class earlier. Um, and so um, not all the information is correct. They certainly didn't meet their doses by the end of, of 2020. But one of the main differences in, is the price point. So the Moderna um, vaccine co costs between $32 and $37 to produce, about $20 for the Pfizer. Um, that the AstraZeneca, um, three to four dollars. So in terms of using it internationally, um, this and Johnson & Johnson's a very similar cost and even easier to administer um, is a, it makes sense for using it internationally for sure because of cost. 
So um, Science Magazine, um, which is the premier science advocacy group in the entire world, um, is declared the development of the vaccines um, as the 2020 breakthrough of the year. So this was really very, very dramatic that this could happen so, so quickly. So um, the, the New York Times publishes their coronavirus vaccine tracker. And even though we, we put all of our attention on those four vaccines, there are many at different phases of development, um, more than almost a hundred different, different vaccines at different phases. Um, six of them are in early or limited use in different parts of the world. Seven vaccines have been approved, including some of those um, that we think are a little sketchy, maybe, um, vaccines that didn't go through full, full testing. And there were some vaccines that were just abandoned after trials because they weren't giving more protection than natural infection. Um, natural infection um, usually produces antibodies about tenfold less than the um, the best vaccine. So those were abandoned. So um, you can see how vaccine rollout is going um, in your state. So the dark green are, are, are doing better on vaccine rollout. So you can see that our states of New Jersey and Massachusetts are all doing really well. Um, New Jersey, it's 29% have received at least one shot, 15% fully vaccinated. Massachusetts, even one point better than that. Um, in the U.S., about 14% of the adults are fully vaccinated. So this is really going very, very fast. And just today, President Biden announced that there would be 200 million doses of vaccine delivered into people's arms by his first 100 days in office. So that he just doubled that number because the vaccine rollout is going really well. So what are our concerns? Um, viral RNA viruses develop mutations that can make them less pathogenic or more pathogenic. Um, and in the case of SARS-CoV-2, it seems like they're spreading more rapidly and maybe being more lethal, especially in the UK version. Um, the mutations make them potentially able to escape the immune response. Um, so some viruses we know do mutate rapidly like flu virus and we need a new vaccine each year and HIV for which we don't have an effective vaccine yet. And coronavirus is certainly going to be added to this. Um, mutations can rapidly replace the parent strain of the virus. The virus that originally infected Wuhan um, likely and was the basis of our original vaccines, um, as far as we can tell, no longer exists in the wild. It's been replaced by mutants. Um, if the mutations affect the receptor binding domain of spike protein, then they may escape antibodies induced by current vaccines. So this is something that we need to be concerned about. Um, and the three companies um, with, that have the use authorization are already working on boosters that would recognize some of these developing mutant viruses. So you may be called back in, in the fall to get a booster. And Pfizer announced today it's starting trials in children as young as five, which is great news for our um, school children. So this is the, the spike protein and you see it here, it's in nice little trimers. Um, this is an electron micrograph, nicely colored, but you see this um, got its name for this corona of the spikes that looks like a crown on the virus. But the mutations tend to, that are important tend to be in these areas where the receptor binding domain um, re is required to interact with the receptor on the human cell. And if it makes a tighter interaction, then it might get into cells more easily. Um, and this is just showing you some of the places where we get mutations and a lot of the important mutations seem to be occurring in the spike region of the virus. So here's the virion and here is a schematic of, of the entire RNA sequence and where you can see mutations. So the entire genome of this virus is pretty small. It only contains 30,000 RNA letters. So these um, variations. So just looking at two of them, the so-called UK variant, which is widely has been widely found in the US, um, you've heard that, that it's very strong um, in Florida, Michigan um, are having a lot of problems, but we see a lot of it in, 
in the Northeast as well. Um, it's been estimated that 20 to 30% of the virus in New Jersey is mutant, whereas even at the beginning of January, it was coming out wild type, wild type, wild type, and then all of a sudden mutant, 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 when my colleague was analyzing. Um, the good news is, is that this UK variant um, is still covered by the existing vaccine. So um, that's, that's really good news. Um, another variant that's showing up in the US is the South African variant. Variant. It's at relatively lower numbers, but still very, um, very much prominent in the Northeast. In fact, the whole, most of the East Coast. And um, there is some concern that the, the vaccine may not be covering quite as well there, but maybe enough since the titers of antibodies are so high. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about more, uh, pregnancy with COVID-19 and the COVID-19 vaccine because there's been some hesitancy to, for pregnant women to take this. The mortality rates um, among pregnant women with COVID-19 are, I think that says 13 times higher, I, it's covered up, um, in similarly aged adults, um, whereas, and pregnant women were three and a half times more likely to require hospitalization. So it's really not, not a great thing to get COVID while you're pregnant. Um, vertical transmission from mother to baby in utero is not common, so that's good. So the question is, is should pregnant women get COVID vaccines because it hasn't been thoroughly tested? There are ongoing trials now. Um, pregnant women are routinely given influenza and pertussis vaccines, um, but the clinical trials didn't include pregnant women. But the World Health Organization came out with a statement, we don't have any specific reason to believe that there will be specific ri risks that would outweigh the benefits of vaccination. So the recommendation is talk to your doctor, but probably get a vaccine. Um, so what's next in COVID vaccines? So it's very normal for vaccines to get replaced by better versions. The inactivated salt vaccine was replaced by the, the live Sabin vaccine. And then as polio largely disappeared, the recommendation went back to the salt vaccine because it had a, a slightly better safety profile. The pertussis vaccine originally included um, whole cells in it and caused a lot of side effects like um, fever and seizures, and it was replaced by a much more um, friendly, uh, child-friendly acellular version, which is just as effective. The original shingles vaccine was replaced by a much more efficacious Shingrex vaccine, which gives you like 97% protection. And sometimes we use a mix and match approach. So for pneumococcal vaccines given to, we'll say mature adults, get one dose of Prevnar 13 followed a year later by Pneumovax. Um, and I had my Pneumovax vaccine today. So my body's probably saying, what, another vaccine so soon? But um, so our first two vaccines showed remarkable efficacy, but we don't know yet what the duration of the immunity is and not and um, if the antibodies are going to wane to a point where they're, it's no longer protective, but we don't know about T cells. Well, we need to adjust the vaccine regularly to account for these variants. Um, and um, yeah, will they become yearly events just like flu if we're gonna get changes in the virus and short-term immunity? There's other technologies coming. Remember the 80 plus vaccines in development, many using different te uh, vaccine technologies. And then the question is, will there be a one-time universal vaccine developed? Um, so what about, um, you probably heard the question about COVID-19 and infertility. Um, so that, that there was the suggestion that COVID-19 um, vaccines affect female fertility because somebody thought that a small region of, of uh, amino acids that the spike protein has um, looked like a molecule that's called syncytin-1 in the pl placenta, leading to the suggestion that antibodies could destroy the, the placenta. But there's no data that suggests that's the case, but it still seems to be circulating in the, in the, um, in the internet. Women in trials got pregnant, um, even though they were asked not to, but, but when you've got large trials, some women are gonna get pregnant and they got pregnant at the same rate 
in the vaccine and placebo groups. Um, it's now being tested officially, but the American Society for Reproductive Medicine says there's no need to delay conception or fertility treatments after vaccination. An interesting fact, women have a much stronger antiviral response than men and are much less likely to die than men of COVID-19. However, because of this, they're much more likely to report stronger side effects from the vaccine with 79% of side effects um, being attributed to women. So um, the claim was that the vaccine was produced too quickly to be safe. Um, and at least in the Western world, all of the appropriate phases of vaccine de development were followed and all aspects of um, safety assurance were taken. And there have been pauses um, to, to the trials or even now to the, the AstraZeneca vaccine that's out, out in the general population um, when there are reports of concerns. So there is no and they are always monitored by independent data safety monitoring boards. So there's no need to say that the um, vaccine was produced too quickly. Um, another kind of crazy one is that mRNA vaccines can alter my DNA. So these um, mRNA vaccines were designed to only stay in the cytoplasm of cells and are degraded quickly. They never enter the nucleus, so they have never interacted with the nuclear DNA. So. Um, you, you're skipping the DNA to RNA step when you inject straight mRNA and you get the protein. So there's nothing to be concerned with. Um, and another concern to Christians is that COVID-19 vaccines contain fetal material. Um, and this, this is not, not true, that none of the vaccines contain fetal material. The Moderna and Pfizer mRNA, mRNA vaccines are synthesized. They're not grown in any cells. So they contain no cellular material, but antibodies from immunized subjects were tested in a fetal cell line that was originally made in the 19, in fetal lines that were made in the 70s and 80s. Um, these vaccines though do not contain any of the, the material, just mRNA, lipids, um, sugar, salts, and acetic acid. The J&J &J vaccine is an adenovector that is grown in per, dot C6, and those did come from um, fetal tissue from 1985, but these cells have been passaged thousands of times and have accumulated many mutations and are immortal. The Catholic, um, and they've been used these cell lines for testing a wide range of medical therapies and vaccines for decades. The Catholic Church, however, has advised that Catholics can take any of these vaccines, but may choose to opt for the mRNA vaccine rather than the J&J &J if it's available. And then the very last thing is what should scientists who are Christians do to help convey the message to the church and the public? They should um, convey facts, the evidence and the truth in ways that are accessible to lay people, but always, always in love. They should model social their social behavior that reflects the current guidelines. And this is changing daily, but we're still being asked by the CDC to maintain social distancing, even if we're immunized, avoiding large inside gatherings and many um, large outside gatherings. Um, they still recommend masks, even if you're immunized. And Francis Collins says double masks. Um, everyone should, Christians should be vaccinated as soon as they are eligible, and they should be up to date on current CDC recommendations. What can fully vaccinated people do? We're planning on meeting up with um, our daughters and their, their children this weekend, since many of us are vaccinated and consider ourselves to be safe. And you should be a source of expert advice in your church and your community. You should know the facts and be honest about what science doesn't know yet. We don't have all the answers. Um, and science facts are always are evolving, hypotheses are being tested, and we always are refining. That is that is a scientific method. Know about the safety and efficacy of vaccines and some of the questions or answers to the questions that are frequently asked. Um, and be prepared to answer questions in churches, your, your small groups, um, and focus on meeting the needs of those who are grieving, out of work and being aware of effects of pandemic on underserved communities. And many of our first line um, workers who can't 
um, work from home. Um, and I do um, credit Francis Collins. I adapted this from something he presented. And I will stop there. Well, Patricia, thank you very much. That was exceedingly fascinating. And I'm sure as we go into our breakout rooms, there's gonna be lots of questions. Um, as I was looking at your statistics, uh, I've been fortunate to be one of the 30% in Massachusetts that got the Pfizer vaccine as part of the buddy system that Mass rolled out about a month ago. My parents live with us and they happened to have their vaccine appointments on a Tuesday. They rolled out the program on a Monday and I went with them to uh, a local hotel here and as it turned out, I got my vaccine in the same ballroom that I had my wedding reception 30 years ago. So it was, it was a blast from the past, but it's been interesting to see every, to hear everybody's uh, varying stories on uh, their experiences. But to your point, I mean, in the scheme of things, it's really astounding how quickly they've been able to roll this out and get people vaccinated. So now we just want to start to open it up and have more of a broad group discussion. Um, one question that I did want to lead off with for uh, Ms. Bo Carsley uh, is, um, what would you say to a person of little science background who's sort of has a skepticism about science and getting the vaccine? How would you sort of approach uh, showing their misconceptions or how they're misled about uh, getting the vaccine and that they're, they shouldn't be as concerned as they really are? Yeah, that's, that's really tough because if someone doesn't share your understanding of science and that, that science isn't perfect um, and that it's based on hypotheses that are tested and then you move forward, I guess I would point out that the risks are really high and the people that are driving the um, infections now are young people and seem to be getting getting these variants very severely. Um, we have a, a person who is maybe 30 who in our church who has been hospitalized with severe pneumonia with, with COVID-19. Um, and, you know, young people are not invincible at all. And young people are the ones having the most of the long COVID um, so that they, symptoms that are going on for months and months and different sequelae to the virus. So I think I would, I would use that as, you know, this has been tested, it's safe, and the consequences of the disease can be horrible. I mean, yeah, maybe you'll come, come away without even knowing you had the infection, but, but if you do get it, it's not a pretty picture. Yeah, I think that's honestly a, a phenomenal way of going about it, just seeing the repercussions of not getting it. Um, I think a lot of people could sort of grab hold of that, and maybe not necessarily the repercussions of getting it, but um, they're much less than not getting it. So, I'm sure you've seen all of the pictures of the spring breakers partying in Miami, and it's like, oh, how could you do this? Yeah. We're waiting yeah. to see what the effects of that are going to be as they bring it back to their colleges. Yeah, absolutely. And then you just see on like Instagram and they're like, like, oh, we've planned this for months now. We can't get can't give this up. And it's it's just sad to see that they're they're willing to let infection increase just to get a spring break in. So. But uh, does anyone else have any any questions or thoughts that were or ideas that were pretty thought provoking during their group discussion? Yeah, the, uh, we were talking in our breakout room about the immune suppression article in the Globe that if you had like a <laughs> an organ transplant or an immunosuppressant drugs that the vaccines won't work well for you. And we do know a couple of people, you know, a good friend of Lars and another good friend of mine that are in that category. Do you have any comments on that, Patricia? Yeah, that's scary. Um, and we're starting a study looking at elderly individuals to see how well they respond to vaccines. So for those individuals, they could use monoclonal antibodies um, from Lilly or Regeneron um, prophylactically. They have to repeat it every three months, but I would think that might be a way to go because that's a, that's a very scary situation. If you can't, you don't have the immunological capacity because you're suppressed to respond. But I think antibody therapy could be useful. 
I had a question because um, I know a lot of people talk about, oh, the, the antibodies are waning, the antibodies are waning. And, and you and I know, I mean, antibodies naturally have a half-life. And once the virus is cleared, they, they do drop fairly quickly into to low levels. But it, it, do the memory cells, the memory B cells, the antibody-producing cells, do they, in some cases, uh, continue producing low levels of antibody that are detectable for a long yeah. time? They do, right? Yes, and I just attended a conference last week and using different computational methods that they feel are more accurate. They feel that the half-life of antibodies in um, COVID-19 is more like 260 days, which is double what the original thought was. So, um, But we are seeing reinfection in Brazil. And so the question there is, is it because it's a variant that the antibodies didn't cover or was it waning or something? But there's still a lot to learn. So, and so I think T cells are really, really important for protection, and that that may be, hmm. you know, having a good T cell response may be um, T cell memory might be sufficient. Hmm. Interesting, uh, Dr. Pauly. What did you talk about in your group? Yeah, um, and, and Craig was in our group as well, so he can help to answer this. But um, yeah, the, the, a couple of questions came up. Well, I, I was kind of curious about what uh, spike proteins were. So uh, Craig just basically filled me in uh, on that. But then we had a more, you know, another question about um, whether wearing masks in the longer term may actually have um, a detrimental effect on our immune system. So if we weren't exposed to different viruses um, because we were wearing masks all the time, that our immune system would actually uh, suffer because of that and we wouldn't be able to uh, cope with um, infections uh, that came along because you know, we couldn't respond to it. Um, Craig, do you want to say what you said about that? Yeah, I think uh, the yeah. idea that by shielding ourselves from viruses, um, we would somehow lose some kind of natural mm, experience to our immune system. And, you know, there is there is some basis for that thought, but I, I I said for sure now is the time to keep the masks on while while this virus is still roving around. Uh, um, and then we we transitioned into the the. Uh, um, uh, Robert's point that at, at his workplace where people work together, no one's getting sick. And it's because <laughs> we've got these masks on. There's no, no colds, no this, no that. It's, it's very effective. And, and I said, well, maybe in the future, the thing to do is for people who are sick to wear masks. And that will have a huge impact on public health, generally speaking. And further, I mentioned, you know, yes, there, there could be this, this idea that to over sanitization has an effect on our immune system. Maybe it could be a deleterious effect, possibly with the greater great technologies we have now with the mRNA type vaccines, we could maybe do a lot more vaccination for some of these other viruses that cause colds and do keep people home from work and stuff in the future. Um, our immune system has pretty much unlimited capacity to develop these memory cells uh, throughout our life. So I don't see that as a limitation. I'd be interested to hear, uh, Professor uh, Bacarsley's ideas on that. Well, I, I think I agree with everything that you said. Um, and you're also an expert. So, um, however, there are problems with the fact that we're in such a clean environment and we do have a lot more what are called um, T type 2 immune responses. Um, and because we don't have enough parasites, um, we don't get exposed to enough things, we get end up with asthma instead of the protective aspects of, of TH2 immunity um, because we don't get exposed to worms. And there's even some, some therapies for Crohn's disease that have involved um, ingesting worms um, to try and switch the immune system to a more natural um, situation for humans. Remember that our level of sanitation is unprecedented in human history. So, but, but you're absolutely right. This is a crisis and, you know, we take off our masks and those many, many more people are going to die. So, um, so for right now, I think we sacrifice a little bit of a natural immunity. 
but um, I have friends who have kids in preschool who say it's wonderful to be, um, to have the kids in masks because they haven't had a single cold. So um, anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, time's up for the group discussion part, um, but it sounds like it was a pretty good, pretty good information discussed there. But um, uh, Vicki, do you wanna start the closing remarks? Yeah, sure. Thank you, everybody. It, it was wonderful. We had a, a great uh, breakout room. Um, Patricia and Andy, it was neat to meet your friend, uh, Christy, who goes to church with you and um, Constance from Gordon College. And it's just really neat to sit here and look at the screen and see the number of, of different people uh, from students all the way up to we had a 50 year member in our group as well. And I'm looking at a number of people that are here from around uh, the country and even Canada. We have our interim executive director, John Wood with us. Uh, John, wave and say hi to everybody. This has been the beauty of our new normal is we are able to do things like this. And John and I were even talking today and who would have ever imagined this a year ago that we'd have this opportunity. And God is just really using these days, challenging days, uh, of course, but for his transformational purposes and his good. And it's just been neat to, to partner with the New Jersey chapter and uh, a number of events that we've done together. And so thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, this was just absolutely wonderful and so uh, informative. And we look forward to uh, Another event coming up, Mike, Paul, and Michael Hahn and members of the New Jersey chapter will, will be in touch as we plan some events for the future. I was pleased to see that during the last hour, we, we had a new brand new student member come across my email. Uh, so it was nice to see Connor. Welcome to the ASA and any of you that are not members and uh, would like to join, just please go to our website. We'd, we'd love to welcome you uh, into our membership. And so as we go tonight, let us um, pause for a word of prayer. So would you pray with me now? Oh, Lord God, you're the ruler of the cosmos and giver of every good and perfect gift, including our inquisitive minds. And you've been our dwelling place, Lord, through all generations. We come to you this day uh, grateful uh, for our many blessings, and we place our faith and hope in you and you alone, trusting that you are using these challenging days, um, again, for your transformative purposes. Please be with Patricia and continue to bless her work at Rutgers and uh, in immunology and her lab. Uh, work and give her effectiveness and wisdom and her service to you and as we celebrate uh, the gift of scientific insight and wisdom, equip us to be the church around the world, living out our, our callings, um, God-given callings, and showing tangible expressions of love and, and concern for our neighbors. And as we are in the midst of this Lenten season, we are reminded of your abounding love for us. You love this world so much that you gave your one and only son that we might be called your children too. So, Lord, help us to live in the gladness and grace of Easter every day. Let us have hearts of thankfulness for your service. Give us eyes that look upon your grace and rejoice in your salvation and help us to walk in that mighty grace and to tell your good news around the world. Um, go with us now in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. And then I just want to say that we're going to be putting out uh, Easter devotionals starting on Monday and running all the way through uh, Resurrection Sunday. So be on the lookout for those in your inbox on Monday morning. And uh, goodbye, everyone, and have a blessed Easter. And thank you for the organizers. I, I had fun. I hope you guys did. We did, Patricia. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Excellent information. Thank you very much.